So the land flash market share, uh, there are not many vendors, only a few. And uh, here, for example, number one, Samsung. Uh, of course, Samsung is uh, always number one in memory, no matter land or, uh, or D run. And the number two is uh, the Toshiba and uh, SanDisk. Nowadays, you know, SanDisk was acquired by Western Digital. And uh, Toshiba and SanDisk, when I say Toshiba and uh, Western Digital, used to uh, work together, co develop the land flash uh, technology. They have joined uh, a fab. And then they co develop the technology. Uh, they are kind of alliance. But uh, the relationship is a little bit uh, uh, interesting. Okay. So although they co invest the R&D, but once the land flash, let's say, manufactured and then package it, then they will put different uh, label or different brand uh, on the market, and then they become competitor. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, uh, very tricky. And uh, since uh, Sandix was acquired by Western Digital, then I don't know what is the relationship right now. So yeah, I, I'm not so sure. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. I was going to ask you about Seagate. Do they, um, they, cut, they only do magnetic, right? Yeah, Seagate, uh, in this sense, is a loser, right, in this business. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, a hard drive, you know, not too much uh, uh, growth there. So, so they should invest in this SSD. And uh, uh, Western Digital first uh, acquired SanDisk. So this is uh, uh, the Toshiba and Sandix alliance. And then uh, another alliance is the Micro and Intel. Okay, they co-developed the land flash technology, similar as the Toshiba and Sandisk. And they have the joint uh, fab, I think, in Utah, and close to Salt Lake City, right? The I IMF. So, so, so they co-developed the technology, and then I think they don't have too much competition after the chip is uh, fabricated because uh, Intel uh, land flash, Intel does not really sell to the consumer. Intel uses it for its own server, own product. So Micron, you know, they sell to others. So they don't have too much competition after this uh, co-development. And then the last one is ST Hynix. Uh, it's still one of the uh, major vendors for the flash. OK, so this is uh, the market share for the flash. OK, so let's go to the technical part. Uh, so this is more important. Uh, Let's start with the floating gate transistor basics. And uh, if you compare the floating gate transistor with the conventional MOSFET, the only difference here is the uh, additional gate in the gate stack. And uh, we call it floating gate. So you have two gates in the flash. One is the control gate. This one is similar to the gate in the conventional MOSFET. <coughs> but what is different here is you have an additional gate. And in this case, it's made by polysilicon. So here, this one is called the floating gate. And then between those gates are the oxide. Okay. So the principle for the floating gate transistor is that we store the electrons in the floating gate. So if you store electrons in the floating gate, like this one, we have the electrons here. Then we call it program state. And uh, typically we use it for zero. Of course, you know zero and one, the definition is arbitrary. But uh, typically, 
we call it zero state. If you don't have electrons in the floating gate, or you remove the electron from the floating gate, then we call it erased state, and uh, that is one. So the difference is in the IDVG curve. So you have the ID versus the voltage, gate voltage. Uh, this gate voltage is applied to the control gate. So here is the VCG, V control gate. So basically it's IDVG. And this is in the linear scale. So the question here is, uh, if you have electrons in the floating gate, would your threshold voltage increase or decrease? It shows increase, but why? So here you say that this is uh, when you have electrons in the floating gate, and this is the zero state, and then this is a corresponding IV, which has larger threshold voltage. Right. Mm -hmm. So why is larger? Uh, is this an this is an NMOS device, right? Yeah, it's NMOS. Okay. So, by the way, so for the flash, always NMOS. Okay. Like DRAM access transistor, always NMOS. So this is NMOS. Any idea why the threshold voltage is larger when you have electrons in the floating gate? The electrons cleaning the voltage, so the channel electrons can see the. Yeah, you can think that way. So you, you cancel out some of the yeah. field. Yes, exactly. So you can think that here, this is a MOS, right? So you do apply positive voltage to turn on the transistor. If you have negative charge on the floating gate, you need to apply additional positive voltage, positive charge on the top control gate to overcome the effect of those negatively charged electrons in the floating gate. So you need to apply additional positive voltage to turn on the transistor. That's why your threshold voltage is larger. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a conceptual explanation for this. So you re rely on the different threshold voltage to determine the state. And then, when you read out the memory, you are going to bias your read voltage somewhere here. Then if the device is in the erased state, you will read out current. And your sense time will tell this is what. And then, if it's in the zero state, proven state, at this voltage, your current is very small. It's below the threshold. So then you don't read out currents. The sense sample will tell this is zero. So that's a principle for the floating gate transistor. By, by saying store electrons, you mean you apply voltage to that gate? Uh, we will talk about how you write the data into the floating gate. Right now, it's, um, you are assuming it's already Program and then you read. You have two states. So CG has to between the two threshold voltages in order to. If you want to read, your read voltage needs to be in the middle between mm -hmm. those two. Okay, so this is the principle, and we will look at more details. So if you look at the structure of the floating gate transistor, and uh, you have two poly gates, <coughs> polysilicon. Doped. This is uh, for the gate. And uh, 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 then we have the two oxide. So between the channel and the first floating gate, here this oxide is called the terminal oxide because electrons will turn through this oxide when you program or erase the uh, floating gate transistor. And then we have a second uh, oxide. And the, actually, it's not only oxide. It's called the interpoly dielectric IPD. So between those two poly gates, so we have this dielectric 
and typically is ONO oxide nitride oxide sandwiched chemical structure here. And when this one is thicker, you don't want turning happen here. So this is a, a, a pure isolation purpose between the control gate and the floating gate. You don't want to have any current there. Um, what's the dielectric of oxide nitride oxide? Is it supposed to be very small? Or is it, or is it, do you want to? So large? here the typical thickness says 150 nanometer. So the third oxide typically like 8 to 9 nanometer. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So those are the typical thickness. And then Again, this is the principle for the program and erase the state and the corresponding IV, and you know which one corresponds to which. And in the circuit symbol, typically we use this kind of transistor symbol. For the floating gate transistor, you add some dash line here representing this floating gate. So you, I think the uh, purpose is to prevent the turn only. So 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 you want to increase some barrier, for example, barrier height. <coughs> so here, this is the equation for the VTH shift. I will not go into the details. But if you want to understand this memory window, we call it a memory window, because this is a delta VTH. That is the VTH shift between the program and erase state. We rely on this VTH shift. And uh, this VTH shift depends on this value. So if you look at the transistor's VTH equation, I will not go into that. It's from your device physics textbook. Uh, you have those phi GS, which is a network function difference. And then two phi F, this is to reverse the, let's say, the, the, uh, uh, from the p type to the n type the channel inversion. And then you have the surface charge effect. But eventually, this term, determines the delta VTH. This is the charge you stored in the floating gate, which is this QT. You store some electrons there. So the total electron charge is QT. And then if you divide it by the C, let's say IPD, this capacitance C, you know, charge divided by capacitance will give you voltage. That voltage is the delta VTH in the IDVG curve. And this CIPD, you know, depends on the epsilon of this IPD and uh, the thickness of this IPD layer. So this is uh, uh, the delta VTH you can get. So simply you can say that the delta VTH proportional to the number of charge you have there. So later you will see that we can tune the number of charge in the floating gate to tune the delta VTH. And this is the way how we make it multi-level cell. We'll talk about that later. But right now it's just a single level cell. You only have two states, zero and one. So let's look at the capacitor model for this floating gate. And here we are going to derive some relationship between the floating gate voltage to the external 
control gate voltage. So here the key concept is that this voltage, or let's say the potential of this load, this is your floating gate. That voltage is uh, internal. You cannot access it. So what you can access is the control gate, because you apply voltage on the control gate. So we want to know if you apply like 10 volts to your control gate, how much of the voltage actually dropped on your floating gate. So there is a coupling issue here. You apply 10 volts to your control gate, maybe only 8 volts drop on your floating gate. So we want to understand this coupling. So we use this, uh, this capacitor model. You can model this with uh, a few capacitors. Right from the control gate to the floating gate, let's assume this IPD layer has CK capacitance. And then from your floating gate, of course, you have floating gate to the channel. So this is a CG, this turning oxide capacitance. And you have the fringing capacitance CS and CD. And then you couple to the substrate CF. So this is a simple capacitor model. And let's define the total capacitance is uh, CT, C total, just uh, a sum of the, all the capacitance here. And uh, then we will define this coupling ratio later. And uh, we'll, let's just uh, derive this. So this simple capacitor model. Let's first assume the source and the drain and the substrate ground zero here, okay. So here we only apply VCG to the control gate. And we want to know what is the VFG. So how do we do this? And then you need to consider the, on the floating gate, you may store the charge QFG there. So, okay, very simple. You know the charge on this floating gate must be contributed by all those capacitance, right? You know, capacitance times voltage give you the charge. So, first, let's look at the contribution from CK. So, CK, and then what is the voltage difference between the control gate and the floating gate? So you have the VFG minus VCG. That's the voltage difference. So voltage difference is delta V, basically. And then for the other CS, CG, CD, it's just a simply VFG times those capacitance, right? Because the other side is ground. So those are the charges on the other capacitors. So all of those charges add up together will give you QFG. And you can rearrange this a little bit. You can take the VFG common outside this and then this VCG. And then you rearrange again. You move turns around and you can derive VFG. is uh, CK over CT VCG plus QFG over CT. And uh, you can see here the coupling ratio, CK over CT, CT is total. So it's defined as alpha CG, this is a coupling ratio from the control gate to the floating gate. Then it also depends on the charge on the floating gate. If you have more charge, then the floating gate potential will increase. So this is uh, with the Vd equals to zero. 
And later, if you have VD, then we need to introduce another coupling ratio because the drain voltage can also affect the floating gate voltage. So there will be alpha D, a coupling from the drain voltage to the floating gate. Sorry, what, uh, what is the QFG here? Is the it's the charge you stored on the uh, yeah, floating gate? Is the have the relationship with the uh, uh, electron stored in the yeah. floating gate? Number of electrons. Okay. okay, so let's look at how to determine this coupling ratio by experiments. Okay, so if this is a problem. For you, then how do you do this? So from the IDVG curve, you can get this. Okay. But you need to make a dummy cell, which means you need to make a, a conventional transistor MOSFET with the same dimension as your floating gate. The only difference is that you don't have that floating gate; you just have one gate. And we call this dummy cell. This is conventional transistor. So in the conventional transistor, of course, you only have one gate. So the floating gate is the same as your control gate. And for the flash cell, your floating gate voltage. Uh, so here, I think you need to assume that uh, the cell is erased. That means QFG is zero. Okay. You remove all the electrons first. Erased. So VFG equals to alpha CG times VCG plus alpha D times VD. So basically, the floating gate voltage coupled to the control gate and drain gate, uh, drain, drain voltage through those coupling ratio. So here we want to de determine the coupling ratio. So first, we we'll assume at a very small VDS, for example, 0.1 volts. And then we can ignore this part for now, because that drain voltage is very small. So then VFG is just, the mean, uh, just the proportional to the VCG through this ratio. And then, of course, the change of the VFG proportional to the change of the VCG. So delta V is also proportional. So we have this alpha CG, uh, VCG divided, sorry, VFG. VFG divided by VCG from this equation. And the, from the dummy cell, you know the delta VFG is the same from the delta VG in the dummy cell because here, dummy cell, this is the same. Okay, so you have this relationship, then we can get this from the IDVG curve shown here. So in this IDVG curve, you know this is uh, the subthreshold region. We have the log scale in the current. And here we only focus on the solid line, because here we assume that the VTS is 0.1 volt. And then we have uh, two curves here. One is this one. This is uh, the flash cell, and the other one is this one. Ignore this dash line for now, because dash line is the large v VDS. So we have those two lines, and this one is for the dummy cell. Okay. So we have those two IV, and then we will get this alpha ratio from this IV. So here, look at this. From the dummy, we, we need to define, let's say, the delta Vg. We can define it by looking at 
the current change by let's say ten times here near the threshold. <coughs> so the let's say from the ten to power five to ten to power six, the negative let's say one micron, ten micron current. So the for the dummy cell, your voltage change from here to here. This is the delta V G here. So you look at those two points. So this is the voltage change, delta V G. And those two points are labeled by this red dash line here. And if you read that, it's like 1.9 here, and this one is like 0.9, so it's a 1.9 minus 0.9, okay. And then in the denominator here, we have delta VCG, this is from the flash cell. From the flash cell, you change from 10 to power, power negative 5 to negative 6, you are changing between those two points. So labeled by the blue dash line here. If you read those two points, it's like 3.2 here, minus this, which is 2. So it's 3.2 minus 2. So you see those four points corresponding to those four points here. I can label it. So this is this point line. This is this one point line. This is 3.2, and this is 2. So from those four points, you determine this alpha CG. And if you do that, it's about 0.83. So roughly, let's say 80% of your voltage can be transferred from the control gate to your floating gate. If you apply 10 volts, then 8 volts will drop on your floating gate. Is this clear?